what our main objective is at the Unemployed Workers Union is to try to organise and empower unemployed workers in a very, very difficult situation. Um, what we do primarily um, is we offer assistance to unemployed workers when they're trying to deal with the increasingly punitive um, social security system. It's not really a social security system in any sense of the word. It's a, I heard someone call it a social insecurity system. I think that's, that about sums it up. Um, I'm going to go into some detail about what the situation is at the moment facing unemployed workers, but I'll just try to give a summary of the, of the AUWU. So we, we're entirely um, run by volunteers and we have no funding, no political affiliations, and we're a national union. Um, we have about 50 volunteers, I would say, who contribute their time every day to the union across, across the country. And I'm, I'm just amazed every day these people are able to do that work. I mean, they're not getting any payment. Most of them are on New Start or a Social Security payment, and they're managing to fight against the system, not only individually, but encourage other people to do that work as well. So, yeah, it's, it's a very inspiring area of activism, and I think the future of activism, in the same way that Tim was talking about, um, farm workers haven't been organised for 100 years, well, there, there hasn't been a national organisation pushing back <coughs> against the attacks on unemployed workers. And I think that shows with the current situation. I think there's been a huge failure across the board for a long time when it comes to unemployed workers and fighting for their rights and dignity. And I'll try and give a bit of a snapshot of what that looks like. So this is a life of an unemployed worker under the coalition. Um, this, this actually quite neatly summarises my life over the past six years. As soon as, as soon as I left uni, like many people, in about 2013, I went into this world of systematic abuse, really. So I had to attend fortnightly appointments with my private employment service provider. So over six years, it's about 150 appointments. And, and that's the best case scenario, because a lot of unemployed workers are actually bullied by their job agencies to make them come in more often, like sometimes two, three times, four times a week. And the idea there is just to bully unemployed workers to the extent where they feel so humiliated going into a private employment service provider that they either get off their books entirely or they accept some sort of employment that's below their standard wages and conditions that they normally would accept. I'll go into a bit of that later. So same, same sort of thing here. Every unemployed worker is required, the standard rate of job application is 20 per month. So I've been required to apply for 1,440 jobs over the last six years. And I've also been required to attend 50 hours of work for the Dole activities um, per fortnight. That's 3,600 hours of unpaid labour. And six out of ten of those sites are dangerous. And that's the government's own statistics that are saying that. And, and th this is currently ongoing. These are, these are the policies at the moment of the coalition and the policies of the Labor Party, I should mention. The Labor Party, in many cases, created this system because they, they were the ones who got the ball rolling when it came to privatisation and they got the ball rolling when it came to activation. That's what this system is called. The idea is unemployed workers are too lazy and stupid to actually uh, represent their own interests and um, get work for themselves, that it's the job of the state to whip them constantly, to apply for jobs, attend meaningless appointments, attend dangerous activities, and all the while you're on a payment that's $243 per week below the poverty line, which makes it actually next to impossible to attend all, that, all those activities due to the travel costs. So people have been ground, beaten into the ground, really, by this system. And on top of this, behind this whole uh, system, you have the compliance regime. So they call this an employment service system, but in, in, in actual fact, it's a compliance management system because there's no employment services actually being provided in this system. So about one million people are filtered through this system every year, but there's no actual service being offered. It's all just, you do this or we penalise you. And going by the current statistics, um, I didn't put this stat up here, but I worked it out. 15, like, you, you're going to be penalised about two and a half times a year 
for failure to meet your requirements. And what that has led to is a huge increase in penalties. So this is, I think, a really good summary of the failure of the left, the failure of unions, the failure of politically aware people to fight back against this punitive regime being put against unemployed workers. So in the late 80s, that's when the Labor Party started putting out this idea of activation. That was then supported and taken up by the Howard government. And then in 2007 8 under the right years, there was a huge increase. And then when Abbott got in, it just went completely crazy to the point where we've had three successive years of two million penalties being imposed on unemployed workers. And a penalty means that your payments are cut. So you have to re-engage with your private employment service provider. And these are private companies that make money off the backs of unemployed. So the only way they can survive is if they get meet outcome payments. And those outcome payments only happen when they force unemployed workers to into certain activities. And because there's such little amount of work out there, they basically create outcome payments themselves. Like Max Employment, for example, their billion dollar US owned company, they have their own training arm and they're just funneling people into their own training arm and, and claiming payments for that. They all find their own little scams in the system. And as a, as a union um, of volunteers, we're trying to keep up with this. And every day we get people calling our hotline, free service that we offer, we're totally free for all members because imagine if we tried to charge for them. Uh, yeah, we, we get calls from people saying, I have no idea what to do. I'm being told I have to do this or I'm going to be cut off. And this is the small percentage of unemployed workers that even know that we exist. So the amount of abuse that's going on where people are just copying it because they feel like they're inadequate because they're unemployed, which is what our society tells them. Yeah, it's, it's, it's quite incredible the amount of abuse that's going on that is ignored by both sides of politics and broadly speaking the left. So this is just the ratio of uh, penalties. So as I said, two and a half penalties per year for, un for each unemployed worker. And that's gone up from essentially uh, next to zero. Um, and in th this is a really shocking stat. Um, the ratio of provider penalties rejected by the department. So there was a period uh, that actually changed recently where every penalty had to be approved by Centrelink. And if Centrelink thought there was an issue with that penalty, they'd reject it. So 50% on average of penalties issued by these private companies were rejected by Centrelink because they found them to be unfair. 50% error rate of penalties. So what, what did the uh, coalition do? Well, they actually introduced a system that got rid of that oversight. So there's currently no government oversight. These private companies now have complete carte blanche to penalise without that oversight and unemployed workers have no rights of appeal. And this is an area we're trying to organise. <laughs> Imagine trying to organise an area where you've actually got no rights, like effectively, because the private companies can issue a penalty. There is no oversight, but there used to be. <laughs> that, like, they know that 50% of these penalties are wrong, but they took away that oversight. And this, that's what's called the current demerit point system, if anyone's heard of that, or the targeted compliance framework which is also supported by both sides of politics. And, you know, all this when you've got a system that has completely no jobs for anybody. So they've created this huge apparatus of a punitive system for unemployed workers when, you know, what are we trying to push them into? I mean, what is the point of an employment service system when there is no work? What is the point of getting people to apply for jobs when currently there's about three million people looking for work. That, that, we got that figure by adding together underemployment, unemployed and the marginally attached in the labour force, so the people that are often not counted in the statistics. So when anyone tells you about the national unemployment rate, it, just laugh in their face. I mean, it, it, it's basically meaningless. It doesn't give you any indication of what the labour market is like. This is a much a more accurate idea of labour market. And if, if you're applying for low-skilled jobs, then it's even more, more sort of um, dire situation because those jobs attract much more applications. So th the amount of jobs available, according to the government statistics, roughly 
oscillates around 250,000, uh, 200,000, and then the amount of people looking for work is about 3 million. So we have to ask ourselves, you know, what are we trying to do in this situation? And the idea of the unemployed workers' union is to try to demand that the government create work for everybody, what, what, what we call a job guarantee. And we think if you create a job guarantee, you're going to completely change the dynamic of the labour market. And because currently the fear of unemployment and the fear of being put into this hot, like this, this quite obviously punitive and deliberately punitive system, that fear is causing people to accept lower wages and conditions they normally would accept. To accept a bullying boss when they normally would not accept that. And I've actually got a pretty good example of that up my sleeve here. So this is a story we got through our website. Um, someone was attending their job agency at Serena Russo, who are a massive private company. Um, so someone came to us and said that they had, that they saw an ad, a job ad, on the books in their job office. And they got a copy of it here. So th this is the ad. It says, this bit down the bottom is most interesting. It says, so it's a cold storage job. It says, this is the actual description of the job. Candidates will be working in cold storage. Due to the high level of machinery in the meat industry, all candidates must be aware that they will sign a work at own risk declaration form, and any accidents they have will not be compensated by the employer. That, that, I think, is a very, very good example of the purposes of this current system that we have that is designed to push unemployed workers into a position where they feel like they don't have any rights and they would want to do anything to avoid being put into a system where they're just going from payment suspension to payment suspension to work for little activity to pointless um, appointments and travelling. It, it, it's almost like um, the old, uh, you know, on the swag days when unemployed workers were made to go from town to town and collect um, rations. It's, it's sort of like that. You're going from activity to activity. It's like the, the, the modern form of that. So the expansion of the tax happening at the moment, which is what the Morrison government is currently pushing, um, they want to introduce a digitalised employment services system. So th th this was, uh, it was, it was quite, funny really because the Job Active, um, well, one of the great successes I think of the AEWU is we've managed to give unemployed workers a voice um, and we got, with the help of the Greens, a Job Active inquiry in the Senate up and that inquiry was scathing of the entire system and they said the system wasn't fit for purpose or something like that. Um, so the, the government realised that the job active system wasn't actually servicing em employers because employers were just getting all these job applications and that was annoying them <laughs> and, a, and a, all these abuses which were coming to light that, that we'd managed to tell people about um, and we got a lot of people to front up at Senate inquiries around Australia to tell, people, tell the government about these abuses. So the government said alright well we're going to use this opportunity to talk about this new system that's going to be much better but basically, what it, they, they, they marketed it as some sort of way that, OK, well, we've listened to what people are saying, and now we're coming up with this new system. Essentially, what they're suggesting is that um, they get rid of a lot of the, the employment service provider um, appointments and such, and make it entirely automated. So every unemployed worker now um, has the option, sometimes they're forced into this, of putting their, all their activity requirements online. So if you, you, you're 20 jobs, for example, you've got to put them online um, in some cases. And if you don't put them online on the right day, you're automatically cut off. So it's an automatic suspension, not done with any human oversight. And the same thing is happening with Work for the Doll. Unemployed workers are being forced to self-report their attendance at Work for the Doll. So that, that they have to self-report all, all these points. And if they don't, then they get cut off. So. It's like this self-perpetuating compliance machine and they've gotten rid of the pretense of providing any employment services at all. Um, which I suppose is more honest, which we appreciate and it gives us maybe a better platform to organise, but it's that the way that they tried to frame it as some sort of a step forward 
was um, yeah, it was interesting. Um, the more attacks is the against the disabled. Um, this isn't an area that we deal much in, but I thought I'd give a bit more context to the wider social security attacks going on. I think probably a lot of people here know about the, the tax the Gillard government put in when it comes to DSP. It's very, very hard to apply for the DSP, deliberately so. Um, but the NDIS is another thing that's happening where it's, it's very similar to what happened with the old Commonwealth Employment Service, people remember that. that, that there used to be a state-run employment services system that actually did provide employment services and it wasn't built on compliance and that was privatised and we have the system we have now. But similar thing is happening in the disability sector where it's all being marketised where you have to basically be an advocate and you're, you're, you're in the private marketplace and you have to try to advocate for yourself in the best way you can. The problem with that is if you're disabled and you've got a bunch of private companies who are trying to make as much money as they possibly can, there's going to be a huge amount of abuse going on just like there has been in the employment services system. And that's what we've seen. Um, robo debt, people have heard about that, 500,000 incorrect debt notices. So, and then single mothers, there have been 73,000 forced into what's called Parents Next, which is a system that demands um, single parents, mostly young mothers, to meet a series of requirements, um, otherwise they get their payments cut off. So there, there are certain, there's a standard that someone in the department has decided this is the standard of being a responsible parent, and for them it involves going to story time in libraries and a a attending a few of those sort of activities, and if you don't attend those activities, you get your payments cut. And th that's been happening across Australia-wide, and it's been a, it's been a huge um, attack on you know the, the rights of of parents, and very a very paternalistic one at that. And what's interesting here, I think, is that you're seeing uh, move away from the traditional attacks on unemployed workers who have historically been seen as undeserving. Undeserving poor this is how unemployed workers have really been betrayed. And that's, governments have been attacking them for 20 years or ever since full employment was abandoned, they've been attacking them mercilessly and calling them doll bludgers. But now we're actually seeing a move away a, a expansion of those attacks onto groups that are, we usually consider deserving poor. People like single parents, single mothers, people on social security who, um, for example, are reporting income um, with these robo-debt notices, now they're being stigmatised and they're trying to be pushed off social security. Disabled people are being stigmatised and told to be pushed off social security. And that's all a result of the failure of us to resist. There's been such little resistance across the board that the government's like, well, we've been attacking unemployed workers for this long, but no one seems to mind. Let's just push a bit further, push a bit further. Attack single parents, attack disabled, attack just the, the concept of social security has been attacked with the robo debt, where you can get issued with a letter saying you, you owe us money because you have no right to social security. They're trying to whittle down the idea that people do have a right to an entitlement. And the Morrison government is pushing forward with this at a great pace with the new department that they've made called Services Australia. I don't know if anybody's heard of that, but they've merged together the Department of Social Services and the Department of Human Services and NDIS. They've merged them together. It's just called Services Australia, which is a very, very uh, insidious name, isn't it? Services Australia. It's, it sounds like they've, they've opened their own, like their new, a new, gov a new corporation or something. And I think that's, that's how it's designed. They're, they're trying to hollow out Social Security and make it into essentially a, a web page that you go on to, you click a few buttons, and then, you, like, that's how you access your social security. And it's a um, it's very concerning time, because we're coming off the back of all these other attacks with, with very little effective resistance. So the government are planning, I think, a huge overhaul and undermining of the social security system as a whole. And what that's going to result in is more instances that we saw at Serena Russo where that person was forced to, or unemployed workers across Australia being forced to accept these jobs where they're not being given basic rights. Because who would, who would want to be in a social security system like this? I mean, casualisation is, is a perfect result of that. People think, well, I'll just, I'll, I'll get, I'll, I'll pick two hours up, you know, at this meatpacking plant where you know, I'm, I'm working at my own risk rather than have to deal with this system. And of course that, 
than if it's employers. So at this point, we're thinking about resistance. Well, it's, it's difficult um, for an organization that has no money, um, very little resources to resist such an overwhelming offensive as this. So what we're trying to do at the AUWU is build solidarity. We need to let unions primarily and other working class rep representatives know how damaging this system is to the working class as a whole. Because it seems like somewhere along the line they've forgotten that an attack on an unemployed worker is an attack on all workers. It's very, very simple. And their governments have been doing it for a long, long time and the results have been catastrophic. The people are scratching their heads wondering why there's no real wage growth. Well, one of the reasons is because people are being put in these positions where they're forced to accept shit jobs. And if they don't want to accept that shit job, they get cut off their payment. So, you know, it's no surprise what's going to happen. Real wages are going to sink. Conditions are going to sink. And that's what's been happening for a long, long time. And unions need to understand that. And, you know, I'm really excited to be working with the NUW and they've been a great supporter of the AUW since the beginning. And we're hoping that we can make sort of a model relationship there and say to other unions, you need to support the work of the AUWU. We've done this basically without any money. We've managed to build a national body, I guess you could say, representing unemployed workers. We're at the point now where we can grow very, very quickly if we're given some resources, very, very quickly. And we're currently trying to get a paid organiser. That's our big goal, a national organiser. Um, we have no, so that, that way we're actually protected. We're insulated from, um, you know, the same issues that every, un, every un, unemployed workers movement's had, where they, their best workers, their best people, get, they get picked and employed. And obviously, if you're in this system, you want, to, you want work. You're not going to sit around and cop that abuse if you can get work. Um, it's interesting that if, if the government wanted to destroy the AUWU, they could tomorrow. All they have to do is offer all our best organisers jobs. <laughs> and we're in a position, being on Newstart, where we actually cannot refuse. So that we need to be employed as AUWU organisers. We need to take the attacks being waged against unemployed workers seriously. And some of the work that we're doing, we're doing an advocacy mentorship at the National Union of Workers at the moment, where every Tuesday we're encouraging our members and supporters to come along and learn how to be advocates for unemployed workers. And I encourage all of you to come to our next session on Tuesday. It's being held at Trades Hall. That's um, 3 o'clock, 3.30 at Trades Hall, where we're doing a, an advocacy training where basically we'll, we'll tell you about how you support unemployed workers on our, on our advocacy hotline and it's very very straightforward we just try to give you the basics of what the system is because although it seems like a hopeless task trying to organise unemployed workers I actually believe that if every unemployed worker knew what their rights were and resisted every time an employment service provider tried to bully them then the system would collapse because it couldn't, couldn't cope with that amount of resistance. There's, as I said, a million people in that system. If you have a million squeaky wheels, <laughs> you know, that's, that, that, that starts to be pretty noisy after a while. And those stories do come out into the media. And I think if, if, if Australians knew what was going on, they knew that these private companies were making millions. Like it's a, it's a, it's a $10 billion system, the employment services system. $10 billion over six years is being handed over to private companies to bully unemployed workers. And they're bullying them to apply for jobs that don't exist. You know, it's a, it's a very, very sophisticated, abusive system. So I'd encourage all of you to come along on Tuesday to learn a bit more about our advocacy work. And we're hoping that that forms the beginning of some, some campaigning potential and people can go out into into um, the world and actually lift a lid on what's going on. We want to start picketing employment service providers when we hear about these cases of them pushing people into unsafe jobs. We need to get it, get it out into the open because it's been hidden away for too long. And if you, if, you, if you can't actually donate your time, then I encourage you to donate your money. 
Uh, on our website, we have um, a donate form, and you know, all, every dollar we get is going to be put towards this fund we're creating to try to get a paid organiser. And we're going to be pushing forward with, um, with a fundraising campaign. Um, and one other exciting note I'd like to end on is on Wednesday, we're having our very first National Planning Day, where all our coordinators from across the country, we're flying them to, to Melbourne. I mean, there's about four people who are outside of Melbourne, so it's not, not that much money, but there's about 20 of us who are going to be in Melbourne, and we're going to be working out our strategies of how we're going to push forward with, with this union. And you know, it's, it hasn't been a, a more exciting time at the moment. To, to be in AEW and I encourage everybody here to, to get involved. Thank you.